Man, I'm not going to be preaching the sermon that I had planned on preaching this morning. I'm going to be preaching something different, and unfortunately, I've got to start out with some very bad news, and that is that, you know, there are still people in our church who are getting sucked into this oneness garbage and forsaking the Trinity. Now, I find that hard to believe since I've gotten up here and preached it to the point of ridiculousness. I've proved it. Hey, you're not supposed to say that it was ridiculous that I talked about it that much. But anyway, you know, I mean, I went up one side and down the other, and I talked about it, and I talked about it, and I proved it with hundreds of scriptures. And then I even put other videos online, the Trinity moments, where I'm just one point at a time. Each one of those 48 Trinity moments disproves this modalist oneness garbage. Any one of them alone does. And there's 48 of them. You know, so I mean, I'm, I'm up here, I'm preaching the Bible, I'm spending hours and hours and hours of time behind the pulpit covering this, I'm putting even more videos online, you know, I don't know what else to do as a pastor, I don't know what else to say except for this, this doctrine is not an optional doctrine, the Trinity is a foundation of our Christian belief, it has been for thousands of years, and we will not budge, we will not compromise, and I'm not going to be a respecter of persons. I don't care who it is. I don't care who believes in this garbage. They're going to be called out, and they're going to be thrown out of the congregation. It's that simple. And you know what? If you've been here for years and years, if you're one that's been at our church for years, and you're like, well, I'm just still not sure, then you know what? Just get out and come back when you're sure then. Because you know what? That is not acceptable to come to this church for years and years and hear me preach about it for hours and hours and hours and hours and you're still not sure if the Trinity's true. You got a problem, buddy. And you know what? You take your problem somewhere else. Now, if you're brand new, if you're a new believer, if you're a babe in Christ, if you've never even read the Bible cover to cover, you know, and you're not really sure what the Trinity teaches or you're a little mixed up on the Trinity, then you know what? Hang around, learn the doctrine. But I'm talking to people that ought to know better, people that have been here for years, people that have read their Bibles cover to cover, and they don't believe in the Trinity. There's something wrong, friend. Now, look, it shouldn't matter who I'm going to bring up because God's not a respecter of persons, and I'm not a respecter of persons. And it shouldn't matter who it is. The truth is the truth. You know, and basically there's been two people that have been affected. First of all, Dominique Davis, that's why he wasn't here last Sunday, has been thrown out because he says, oh, God's not three persons, God's only one person. What? Hey, sit down, sit down. What are you, what are you coming up here to do? You want, you want to come take over the service? Huh? What, what do you want? What? I just want a prayer rep. Get out of here. Can I get, can I get a little grace? No, 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 you can't. No, no. You, you get out of here. Get him out of here. Drag this bozo out. Pull him out. Hey, Let help him, him out. Get, get him, him out. Let him walk. You can walk in the zone and we'll get him out of here real quick. All right. And you know what? Anybody wants to come up here and take over the service? We'll throw you out of here, buddy. This church is not a free-for-all. This isn't an open mic. This isn't a karaoke bar, okay? I'm the man of God here. I meet the qualifications. I run this church, and if you don't like it, then get out. This is not some church where every first-time visitor and brand-new believer and people who've never even read the Bible are going to come up and take over the service. Not happening. Okay? If you want that kind of watered down leadership, go to some house church with your Amish buddies and sit around the coffee table with your coffee clatch. This is a New Testament church. We have a bishop here. We have an overseer here. Like it or lump it. And if you don't like it, feel free to get up and leave the service at any time. And if you're one of these oneness people, why don't you have the guts? Why don't you have the courage to get up and leave right now? Amen. Huh? Have the gall and the courage to come and face us and tell us. Instead of being like Dominique who texts us. After he sat, you all heard him sit in the front row of this church yelling amen every time I preached about the Trinity. Go back on YouTube. Watch all the YouTube videos. And what's he doing? He's sitting in the front row yelling amen. And now he's telling people, oh, I never really fully agreed on the Trinity. Then why'd you yell amen every time I talked about it and every time I preached against oneness? I'll tell you why. Because he's a hypocrite. That's why. People are hypocrites who like to sit in the front row and say amen loudly, even though they don't even believe in it. That's called being a hypocrite. 
And then it's like they're yelling amen one day, and then two days later it's like, oh, I'm, I'm, i got to leave the church because I don't believe in the Trinity. You say, I'm not comfortable with this. Then just take a hike. Go take a hike. You know what? You ought to be thankful that you have a pastor who stands on Bible doctrine yeah. and doesn't care what people say. And I don't care if 90% of people get up and walk out or 50% of people walk out. I don't care. Because you know what? I'm not going to pastor a oneness cult. Amen. I'm not going to pastor a Pentecostal church. I'm the pastor of a Baptist church. Amen. And if you're not a Baptist, then get out. Amen. We're not going to let a bunch of heretics come in and split this church and bring in all this junk. This church is going to be unified around Bible doctrine. Amen. It's not happening. And you say, well, it's just a okay, sweetness and light. Can't we all get along? You know, we could all get along if people would actually believe the Bible. Amen. But they don't, so sometimes we have to crack some heads. Yep. If you're not comfortable with it, go down to Comfortable Baptist. <laughs> where anything goes, where people can believe whatever. Now look, there are lots of doctrines that are optional. You know, things that aren't as clear in Scripture, things that don't affect salvation, things that don't affect the nature of God. If people have different views on end times prophecy, if people have different views on, you know, the Jews or Israel or something, that's fine. You know, you say, oh, I don't quite agree on the reprobate doctrine. Fine. But you know what? The Trinity is not optional. And I, you're going to be shocked when I tell you who's getting mixed up in this now. And I don't know how deep he is into it, but now Garrett Kirschway says that the Trinity is a false doctrine. I mean, he's been up here behind this pulpit preaching the Trinity, preaching against Jesus-only baptism, preaching of, of all people. He's been here with us all along. Through all this teaching, through all this preaching, I can't even believe it. And you know how I found out? Did I find out because he came and told me, because he had the guts to come and tell me, hey, by the way, I'm on your staff, and I don't believe in the doctrine of the church. I don't believe in the Trinity. No, I found out because I saw his wife commenting on Tyler Baker's videos, like, oh, great sermon, brother. And I confronted him about it. Bunch of cowards. Makes me sick. Makes me sick. And you know what? If any of you cowards are out there right now, just come clean right now. Just get up and walk out because if you don't believe in the Trinity, you are not welcome in this church. Okay, what are we going to bring in next? The Muslims? What are we going to bring in? Hindus and Buddhists and Jews and whatever? Look, it's a Baptist church. It's not seeker sensitive. It's not anything goes. It's the Trinity. It's the Baptist church. It's not optional. And so as of this morning, he's fired. You know how long it took me to fire him? 30 seconds, 30 seconds. And you know what? You know how long it's going to take me to throw somebody out of this church that doesn't believe in the Trinity? 30 seconds, 30 seconds. Now you open your Bibles to Genesis chapter one. And if by the time I'm done preaching this morning, you don't believe in the Trinity, then get out and don't ever come back. Amen. I'm not going to let this cancer creep in. I'm not going to let this poison in. We are performing surgery this morning. Amen. And you know what? I don't, it, there's going to be no anesthesia. We're using, a, we're using a, a, a hacksaw, okay? So take a swig of Jack Daniels or whatever because there's going to be no anesthesia. We are cutting this cancer out. And I don't care if we have to amputate the whole toe or the foot or the leg. We're going to save the body. Amen. We're keeping this thing alive. You don't have to get very far reading the Bible to find the doctrine of the Trinity. Now, let me just make this clear for us. And if you think this is a repeat or if this is redundant, then explain to me why people are still mixed up. Apparently, it needs to be preached more. Apparently, we need more teaching on this. And I'm not going to stop until it's fixed. And I would rather die than to pastor some half Trinity church. Not going to do it. Not going to do it. I, I'll go get a job somewhere else before I ever do that. Never going to happen. Now, let me just make this clear. The Trinity is a New Testament doctrine. And everybody pay attention. If I catch anybody not pay attention, I'll call you out. You pay attention. You look up here and listen. and look. You look in the verses with us as we're reading. Okay, this is important sermon. Don't think, oh, I already know this. You listen anyway. You say, well, you sound mad. You better know I'm mad. Yeah, I am mad when my employees stab me in the back. You know, when people who, who you trust, you know, people that, somebody that I baptized with these very hands, 
and then turns around and goes off into heresy and doesn't even have the guts to come tell me about it. You better know I'm mad. It's a righteous anger at heresy and lies and false doctrine. Amen. And by the way, this, this is streaming live. I don't believe in hiding the truth. Put it out in the open. Let it be known far and wide that our church believes in the Trinity. Now, let me just start out by saying this. The New, the New Testament is where we found the Trinity taught in detail. The Trinity is not taught in detail in the Old Testament. And you know, the heretics, they love to hang around in the Old Testament to disprove the Trinity. Well, let me tell you something. The Trinity is taught in the New Testament because in the Old Testament, God doesn't reveal all things clearly like he does in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, they saw through a glass darkly but in the New Testament, we see face to face. I mean, in the New Testament, we know all about Jesus, his ministry, his death on the cross, his burial, his resurrection. They only had a shadow of that in the Old Testament by seeing animal sacrifices and by seeing the story of Abraham offering Isaac, his son, on the altar. Things like that indicated Christ, but they didn't see it as clearly as we do in the New Testament looking back. Well, the Trinity is the same way. The thing that the Old Testament emphasizes throughout is that there's only one God. And the reason that God is emphasizing that is because all the nations have their own gods. So when God divides up mankind at the Tower of Babel, you've got different gods for the Egyptians, different gods for those in Mesopotamia, the Philistines, the Zidonians. Each people group has their own particular gods. But then there's the God of Abraham, right? The God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of Israel. And the Bible is emphasizing in the Old Testament that that's the only true God. You know, what's he saying? All the gods of the nations are idols. The gods of the Philistines are idols. The gods of the Zidonians are idols. It's only the Lord. He's the only true God. Jehovah God is the only God. So that's what the Bible keeps hammering in the book of Psalms preaching against other religions and other deities and other idols and saying, no, 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 there's only one God. It's the Lord. It's Jehovah. It's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Then when we get into the New Testament, there's a special emphasis on Jesus being the Son of God. And if you have Jesus as the Son of God, and then you also have scriptures saying that Jesus is God, well, then right away we need some explanation, don't we? You know, how can Jesus be God and be the Son of God. So that's why the New Testament spends page after page after page explaining the fact that God is made up of Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, and that it's always been that way. All the way back in the beginning, there was the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost before the world even began. So there are all kinds of explanations about the relationship between God the Father and Jesus and where the Holy Ghost comes into play. Whereas in the Old Testament, that's not something that's being emphasized. In the Old Testament, that's not the focus. But once you've read the New Testament, you go back to Genesis 1, and now you start seeing the Trinity on every page. Amen. Once you know it's there. Even though it's not fully explained in the Old Testament, it's there. And it's sort of like when you're reading a book that has a plot twist. And, you know, those of us who like to read, when you read a book and it has a plot twist, some piece of information comes out in the very end or maybe halfway through that's a shocking piece of information where you realize that the good guy was actually the bad guy or the bad guy was actually the good guy or this guy was really, you know, someone other than we thought he was or this narrator has been lying to us or whatever, right? Who knows what I'm talking about with the plot twist or, you know, whether it's in a, a movie or a book or whatever, right? Well, that's sort of how it is with the Bible. You know, you're reading the Bible and it's one God, one God, one God. Then you get to the New Testament, all of a sudden you got Jesus. All of a sudden you got the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And then that's kind of a twist in a sense. Then you go back and you have to read it again, right? And then when, whenever you have a, a novel with a good plot twist, when you go back to the beginning, you're seeing it on every page because there are all kinds of foreshadowings of that and there are all kinds of clues and hints. And you actually think to yourself like, how could I have been so dumb? Like, how did I miss that? I should have known that guy was the bad guy all along. I mean, you know, there are all the clues are there. That's how it is with the Trinity, okay? So even all the way back to Genesis 1. So we get to the New Testament, we read about the Trinity, then we go back to Genesis 1 and there it is. Look at verse 26. And God said, let us make man in our image, after our 
likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. Notice the singular, his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Now, when we talk about that pronoun, our or us, that is what's called a personal pronoun, right? Because a pronoun referring to a person or persons. So it's called a personal pronoun, right? Non-personal pronouns could be pronouns like it or that. But when we have the pronouns he, she, it, they, us, we, those are personal pronouns. But not only is this a personal pronoun, this is a plural personal pronoun. So if we have a plural personal pronoun, then we have more than one person. Is everybody listening? There's more than one person there. Now in Genesis 1.26, it says, God, and God said, let us make man in our image. Here's a little rule about pronouns. They must have an antecedent. Ante means before, cedent means going. So something that goes before. It doesn't make any sense to talk about we and us unless I first tell who that is, right? There has to be some explanation. If I say he went to the store, who went to the store? Dustin went to the store. You know, there has to be some kind of an antecedent to tell us who the he is, right? Well, who's the antecedent in this passage? Who is God talking to when he says, let us make man in our image after our likeness? The antecedent is God, because God is three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And so that's why God says, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Now, some have said, oh, he's talking to the angels there. Where are the angels in this passage? There's no mention of angels in chapter 1. There's no mention of angels in chapter 2. The first mention of angels is way later when man gets kicked out of the Garden of Eden and you got cherubims guarding the tree of life with a flaming sword. And we'll get there in a moment. But right here we see there's no angels. You can't just make, why don't you just put Mickey Mouse in there as an antecedent? You can't just stick whatever the antecedent you want and just start making things up. It better be there in the passage. And it says right here, God said, let us make man in our image. And notice, it doesn't say, so God and the angels, you know, created man in their image. No, no, no. It's only in God's image that man's created. Only in God's image. No one else. He said, our image. And he can't be talking to the angels because the angels that he would be talking to are not in his image. They look different. They've got wings and everything else. I already preached two sermons on that uh, last Sunday morning and Sunday night. If you weren't here, then, you know, maybe you should go back and listen to those. But I, I taught on that clearly. And so we see here that God is a plurality of persons. That's why he says, let us make man in our image. That's the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost saying, let's make man in our image. This makes sense. Let me show you why. Go to Hebrews, flip over, keep your finger in Genesis 1, we'll be back there. Hebrews chapter 1. It's so funny, this week I've just been obsessing over Genesis chapter 1 and I didn't know why. Because I really wanted to preach a sermon out of Genesis chapter 1. And so all, all, all this week, I just kept reading Genesis chapter 1. I was like, man, I want to preach a sermon about this. And I kept reading it and reading it and reading it. And I was thinking of a creation sermon. You know, something about creation, about God creating on the different days. And it just, I, I just couldn't make it happen. Couldn't make it work. Kept wanting to preach. I kept waking up in the middle of the night last night and just like reciting Genesis 1. As I was like half asleep. I was just, quote, I was just like, you know. And God, you know, divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And I was just quoting it. I woke up quoting it. I spent hours this morning trying to write a sermon on Genesis 1, and I could not come up with a sermon. So then I'm like, forget it. I'm preaching on 2 Kings chapter 5. So I was all ready to preach on 2 Kings chapter 5. And then I find this out. It's like, all right, let's go back to Genesis 1. And now I got that Genesis 1 sermon. Hebrews chapter 1, if you would, look what the Bible says in verse 1. God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory, watch this, and the express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Now, there's a lot in these verses, but let me break this down to you. The Bible says that God spoke in the past in various different ways, right? Sundry times and in divers manners by the prophets. 
But in these last days, verse 2, God has spoken unto us by his Son. Now stop there for a minute. If God spoke to us by his Son, are we talking about God the Father or what? I mean, if he spoke by his Son, he must be the Father of the Son, right? So clearly when the Bible says God in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, we're not just talking about God in general. We are specifically talking about who? God the Father is who we're specifically talking about because God the Father, pay attention, spake by his Son. Now, don't tell me the Son spake by his Son because then I want to know who's the grandpa. Then we're going to, I guess we might as well go up to the Navajo reservation and smoke some peyote and start praying to great grandfather. That's who those peyote smokers up there pray to, great grandfather. No, if there's no great grandfather, there's God the Father. Amen. And then there's the Son, Jesus, okay? Now, it's the Father speaking by his Son. Everybody got that? whom he hath appointed heir of all things. Who appointed Jesus heir of all things? God the Father appointed Jesus heir of all things. By whom he made the worlds. So God the Father made the worlds by Jesus Christ. Does everybody understand that? It'd be like if I sent a message to my wife by Dustin, if I folded up a message and said, hey, you know, go take that to my wife. I notified my wife by Dustin. He was my agent, right? I gave him instructions. He carried out the instructions. Everybody following? So God, the Father, made the world by Jesus Christ. Watch this. Who being the brightness of his glory. So Jesus is the brightness of God the Father's glory. And the express image of his person. So Jesus is the express image of God the Father's person. Everybody understand that? And upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Now, what does it mean that he purges sins by himself? Well, remember, God the Father created the world by Jesus Christ. Everybody understand? Jesus Christ sacrificed himself. So what did he do? He actually purged our sins by himself, meaning that Jesus did not send someone else to do it for him. Jesus did it himself, as opposed to the Father sending the Son to be the Savior of the world or creating the world by Jesus Christ as his agent, right? And then it says, when he had done that, he sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. And how many verses are there in the Bible, folks, that say that Jesus is sitting in heaven on the right hand of the Father? I don't care what that devil, Tyler, can get up and say, every time you look at it, there's only one throne. There's only one person seated on the throne. That is a lie because there are a ton of examples where there's God the Father and Jesus sitting at his right hand. That's two people. Right. Jesus is standing at the right hand of the Father in Acts chapter 7. Jesus is seated at the right hand of God in this passage and in many others. Now, what is this saying? If Jesus Christ is the express image of God the Father's person, you know what that means? That means that Jesus Christ not only resembles God the Father in his appearance, but he looks just like God the Father in his outward appearance. So it would be sort of like if you looked at my son, you would say that my son is in my image. He looks like me. Sort of like when Seth was born, you know, a son was brought forth in Adam's image. But let me ask you this. Was Seth the express image of Adam's person? No, because they don't look exactly the same because he's going to have some attributes from his mother as well, right? So my children, some of them look more like me than others. Some of them take more after mom than others. None of them is the express image of my person. But if we were to take, for example, John and Jesse McPhail, who are identical twins... And we look at John and Jesse, you know, that's the express image right there. Why? Because not only do they look similar, not only are they related, but they actually look the same. So that if you've seen the one, you've pretty much seen the other, right? <laughs> and it took me, now, these days, if I look at, you know, it'd be like if, if, if one of those brothers was going to go on a, a blind date. Well, I want to see what he looks like first. It's like, well, if you've seen the one, you know, that's what the other one's going to look like. You know, so don't try to set them up on a blind date or anything. I'm just throwing that out there. But the point is that, you know, 
If you've seen Jesse, you know what John looks like and vice versa because they look the same, right? Well, that's the way it is with Jesus and God the Father is that Jesus is the express image, not just the image, but the express image. That's just a stronger image, okay? The express image of his person. Now, look, if Jesus is the express image of his person, then he's not the person. If I said, this is an express image of my wife, this is exactly what she looks like, I'm not holding my wife. If I picked up my wife right now, and don't make me do it, if I picked up my wife right now and said, this is the express image of my wife, that wouldn't make any sense, would it? Because I would say, this is my wife. Jesus Christ is not God the Father. Jesus Christ is the express image of his person. Why? Because there's Jesus' person, and then there's God the Father's person. And then there's the person of the Holy Spirit. That's why they use a per plural personal pronoun. So we see that here, that when God said, let us make man in our image, that makes perfect sense. Why? Because they have the same image. Jesus and the Father and the Holy Ghost, because they have the same image, they can say, let's make man in our image because they all have that same image. Right? It'd be like if John said to Jesse, let's draw a picture in our image. They, we don't need two pictures. They could draw one picture and say, this is in our image. It looks like us. Right? Easily. And if you don't think so, then, you know, ask yourself why in the church directory their names are accidentally reversed. Okay? Now, look, I knew right away. When I looked in the church directory and I saw those two names reversed, I knew right away, I was like, this is wrong. Because I can tell them apart a mile away. But for the first couple months, I couldn't. For the first couple months, I'd have to look at them stand next to each other and compare certain features. Now I can spot them a mile away, but at first it's hard, right? Because they look so much alike. So that's Genesis chapter 1. Look, don't try to wiggle out of Genesis chapter 1. Bunch of Jews, bunch of oneness Pentecostals. Don't try to wiggle. You can't wiggle out of it. God put it on the first page of the Bible on purpose. And you know, by the way, the evolutionists of the Big Bang, they can't wiggle out of this chapter either when he said over and over again that everything brings forth after its own kind. Don't try to put evolution into this passage. It isn't there. Don't try to put oneness. And these oneness heretics, what they always love to hammer is, oh, well, the Old Testament really hammers the oneness of... Really? That's funny because not the Old Testament that I'm reading. Because the Old Testament that I'm reading on the very first chapter says us and our. I mean, look, if I were writing a book and I wanted to hammer the oneness of God, I wouldn't put a plural pronoun on the first page about God. You know, if the Hebrew Israelites are these hardcore monotheists, you know, they're just hammering the oneness of God, then why'd they put a plural pronoun on the first page? You know why? Because they didn't write it. Because God wrote it. Because it's the word of God. And whether they fully understood the Trinity or not, God spake all these words. And when Moses wrote it down, whether he knew it or not, when people quoted this even before Moses, whether they knew it or not, God's going to explain it later. It's the Trinity. It's the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Why? Because God created all things by Jesus Christ. And so you have God. And then even in this passage, you have the Spirit of God in verse number two. Of course, some of the modern versions will try to change this to the wind of God. But in Genesis chapter one, verse two, if you're there, it says, and the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. So it's pretty clear that all three members of the Trinity were present and active in creation. God the Father, Jesus, and the Holy Ghost are all involved, the Spirit of God. Now, not only that, but I preached a whole sermon a few weeks ago on the names of God. And we went through the seven, what I felt like were the most important or primary names of God in the Old Testament. And guess what? Two of the top three names for God are plural. Because they're just trying to hammer the oneness of God, right? That's why Elohim is plural. That's why the Eam ending, if you read the Bible, what's Baalim mean? Baals. Cherubims. Multiple, right? So Elohim in Genesis 1, verse 1, in the beginning, God created heaven and earth. The word for God is plural in the first verse. Then the word for Lord, Adonai, is plural. Name of God. 
And all the names of God in the Old Testament, I proved in those sermons, can be used about the Father or the Son or the Holy Ghost. They all apply to Jesus, whether it's the Lord of hosts, whether it's God Almighty, you know, and again, I'm not going to re-preach those sermons, but I spent two hours going through all the Old Testament names of God that are the most significant and proving that they all reference God the Father and Jesus. That makes sense why two of the most common and important are plural. But then people will try to tell you, oh, it's just trying, you know, the Old Testament is just hammering the oneness. Really? Let's go to chapter 3 and see if we can find oneness there. Genesis chapter 3, this is when man is kicked out of the Garden of Eden. And the Bible says in Genesis chapter 3, verse 22, And the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us. So not only does he use the pronoun us, he even says one of us. So you can't even say like, and this is what the Jews will try to say, because you know, the Jews have to explain this, why their Torah has this plural pronoun on page one. And the Jews will say, well, that word Elohim and Adonai, those plural words, that's just because God's royalty, they'll say. And, you know, the reason he says us and our, he's just royalty. Well, that's funny because there's no example of that anywhere in the Bible of royalty being called we, our. And there's no example anywhere in the ancient world. There's no example in any archaeology, any ancient literature, anything. The, the first time you'll find that is in England. You know, with the queen being stupid enough to call herself we and us. <laughs> the first person who was stupid enough to do that was some king of England. We this and we that and we are going to do this. Okay, but I guarantee you the queen of England isn't going to say one of us. Hey, one of us is going to that royal wedding. <laughs> Not even the queen of England would do something so foolish, would she? One of us is going. I mean, she might be so pompous and full of herself to say, we're going. And it's, but she's not going to say, one of us is going. Okay, well, then that means one isn't. How many of you are there? <laughs> Legion, for we are many, right? <laughs> I'm sure a lot of that royal family is demon-possessed. But the Bible says in Genesis chapter 3, the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. And now lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drave out the man and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Now I, I just, I know I'm moving slow this morning. I usually preach faster than this. But we got to slow down, folks, because so, we're, we're losing people somewhere. People are missing it somewhere. I don't, know where, I don't know where that weak link in the chain is or if people are just wicked or foolish or what they are. I don't know. But you know what? We're going to slow down and we're going to figure this out, where we're losing people on why they don't understand this basic doctrine that is not that complicated. So we're going to slow down and we're going to park it here, okay? So let me bring a couple guys up. Can I, can I bring you two guys up here as an example, okay? So I just want to illustrate this. this what, what does he mean when he says, one of us, okay? So right here we got three of us, right? Okay, so let's say we all three have something in common, right? We're all wearing a tie, right? Okay, so let's say we're standing up here and we're three persons up here, right? And we're all, what do we all have in common? We're all wearing a tie, right? Well, let's say that Brother Jason has never worn a tie to church before in his life, okay? And let's say nobody else in the church wears a tie. We're the only three guys that wear a tie, right? The three of us. Jason's never worn it, and he shows up on Sunday morning, and what's he wearing? A tie. Okay, so what? stand up, Jason. So now I say to these other two persons, I say, behold, Behold, Jason is become as one of us. <laughs> now look, would that make sense? Yeah. Hey, Jason has become like unto us. In fact, he's become as one of us. Now, are we saying that he's only like one of these three? Like he's just like me or he's only like Nick. Is that what I'm saying? He's only like Brother Juarez. That's it. No, no, no. When it says one of us, what I'm saying is, hey, he's become like unto one of us because we're all wearing ties, and now he's wearing a tie. 
You're one of us. Okay, go ahead and have a seat, gentlemen. Does everybody understand that? Are there any questions about that? Are there any questions? Okay, now let's have a different illustration. Okay, I am here wearing my tie and there's only one person. Nobody else wears a tie. Jason shows up in a tie and I say, Behold, Jason has become like unto one of us. You'd think that I was crazy. It wouldn't make any sense because I'm only one person saying a plural personal pronoun. Oh, Jason has become as one of us now to wear a tie. You know, it doesn't make any sense, folks. Let's keep going. Let's go to Genesis chapter 11. Genesis chapter 11. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 11. And the Bible says... In verse number six, and the Lord said, behold, the people is one. And they have, oh, I guess they're all one person. Right? Because that's what these, these Trinity deniers, that's what they do. Whenever they see the word one, they're just like one person. So when it says, you know, the people is one, what does that mean? Does that mean there's only one person? No, it means that the people are united and they form one entity, Right? There's one entity. For example, there's one church, but many members, right? Well, here there's one nation that's made up of many people. And the Bible says, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do. And now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language is, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Go to Hosea chapter 12, Hosea chapter 12, and this is a review from last week, but we're going to see it again because apparently it didn't sink in last week. Hosea chapter 12, and for those of you who do believe this, God bless you, and you know, I'm not trying to frustrate you by running this into the ground, but you know what? What else can I do? We have to hammer this, and I hope you, I hope you learned something new this morning. I hope, I hope you sharpen your sword a little bit this morning. But, you know, we just got to keep talking about it. I mean, if I wake up in the middle of the night quoting scriptures about the firmament and reciting Genesis 1 in my sleep, you know, then I, even the most basic chapter has something for all of us. Amen? And we need to lay the foundations strongly today in 2018. This is not a coincidence that this doctrine is popping up all over the place. It's, it's been unknown amongst Baptists. It's been unheard of. Every evangelical Christian, every Baptist church has stood on the Trinity and all of a sudden it's just popping up online everywhere. Popping up, popping up. The first one I saw was Brian Denlinger with his Ruckmanite channel. And he came out with it, you know. And then Tyler Baker came out. And then all these people are coming out with it. It's just, it's, it's just, it's a demonic spirit or something that's spreading this doctrine. But the Bible says in Hosea chapter 12, I got to find my place. This, this wasn't in my notes because I don't have any notes because I wrote a totally different sermon that I'm not preaching. Am I in the wrong chapter? No, no, here it is. Hosea chapter 12, verse 3. It says, He took his brother by the heel in the womb, and by his strength he had power with God. Yea, he had power over the angel and prevailed. He wept and made supplication unto him. He found him in Bethel, and there he spake with us. So Jacob spake with us us and then we indicate exactly who the us is because it says even the Lord God of hosts the Lord is his memorial so who's the us it's the Lord God of hosts so he says he spake with us even the Lord God of hosts the Lord is his memorial now we already had God mentioned earlier when it says by his strength he had power with God and he had power over the angel and so forth but then it's changed to an us and then it says even the Lord God of hosts now who is it that Jacob wrestled with go back to Genesis 32 quickly Genesis chapter 32 Genesis chapter 32 after Jacob wrestles with quote the angel or what the Bible calls in Genesis chapter 32 quote a man it says in verse number 30, and Jacob called the name of the place, everybody there in Genesis chapter 32, verse 30, 
And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. And as he passed over Peniel, the sun rose upon him, and he halted upon his thigh. So what we see here is that the name of the place is called Peniel, because Jacob said, I saw the face of God. Now, he did not see the face of God the Father. How do we know that? Because what did God the Father tell Moses? No man shall see my face and live. Nothing could be clearer than when God tells Moses, because it says in that very chapter, I, I believe it's Exodus 32. I don't know exactly. Somebody help me out. Is that the right chapter? Jonathan, you and I were just talking about this. Maybe you can look it up for me. In Exodus 32, it says that God spoke face to face with Moses, but he spoke face to face with Moses out of a cloud. So there's a cloudy pillar and he speaks out of the cloudy pillar so that what? So that Moses cannot see his face because he's surrounded by a cloud. So when God the Father speaks to Moses, quote unquote, face to face, there's a cloud there so that he cannot see him. And God explains to him why a few verses later when he tells him, no man shall see my face and live. So what he does for Moses is he gives him just a glimpse. Are, are you there? Did you find it? 33, Genesis 33, Exodus 33, 20. Exodus 33, 20. The Bible reads in Exodus chapter 33, verse 20. And he said, thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there's a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock, and it shall come to pass while my glory passeth by, that I will put thee in a cliff of the rock, and will cover thee with my hand while I pass by, and I will take away mine hand, and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. This is pretty clear. This is clear scripture about not being able to see his face. And earlier in the chapter, somebody help me find the part that I want earlier in the chapter. Verse number nine, it says, it came to pass as Moses entered into the tabernacle, the cloudy pillar descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle and the Lord talked with Moses. So he comes and talks to him out of the cloudy pillar, okay? Why? Because no man can see his face. Now, he spake to him as a man speaks to his friend, but there's a, a veil there of a cloudy pillar separating the vision so that he cannot see God's face because nobody can see his face and live. Okay, well, if no man can see God's face and live, then how did Jacob look at his face and say, I've seen the face of God? I'll tell you how. Because he saw the face of Jesus. That's how. Because no man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. So when Jesus Christ walked on this earth, who are we seeing? We're seeing God in the flesh. God manifest in the flesh. But we're not seeing God the Father or everybody would be dead. Because no man can see his face and live. Nobody's ever seen him. So in the Old Testament, this would have been a paradox. This would have been something that would have confused people where they're reading like, no man can see your face, but then how did Jacob see your face? And also, God appears to Abraham in Genesis 18. Go to Genesis 19, if you would. Go to Genesis 19. In Genesis 19, the Bible tells us in another perplexing verse to those who have not understood the Trinity, Verse 24, then the Lord rained upon Sodom and Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. Why is that? Because the Lord was on this earth. Because the Bible says that the Lord appeared unto Abraham in the heat of the day in the tent door. He walks right up to Abraham and he actually has a meal with Abraham and communes with Abraham face to face in human form. And then in the next chapter, what does the Lord do? He rains fire and brimstone upon Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of heaven. Why does it say the Lord rained fire and brimstone from the Lord out of heaven? Because there was the Lord on this earth and then there's the Lord in heaven because there's the Father and the Son. So again, in the Old Testament, there are all kinds of foreshadowings of this. 
even though it's not clearly explained until the New Testament, we see the concept all over the pages of the Old Testament. And look, I could go on and on. I want to get to some New Testament scripture before we shut this thing down. Go to the book of John. Actually, go to Matthew 20, and then we'll go to John. Matthew chapter 20. So, you know, I could go on and on just showing you all the Old Testament scriptures that foreshadow this. You know, not to mention Genesis 22, where Abraham offers Isaac his son as a sacrifice. Why? Because it pictures the father offering Jesus as a sacrifice, right? But then, of course, he stopped at the last minute, and there's a ram caught in the thicket that's the substitute. Jesus Christ is our substitute. But we have that picture of the father giving his only begotten son. It even used that word in Hebrews 11 that Abraham offered his only begotten son. Who does that picture? Obviously, God the father sent Jesus to be the savior of the world. Have you ever read John 3, 16, people? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So did God the Father come down and do it himself, or did he send his son to die on the cross for us? He sent his son to die for us, period. Now, look, Matt, if, if you don't understand what I'm about to show you in Matthew chapter 20, verse 23, you might be ready for a straitjacket, okay? Look at Matthew chapter 20, verse 23. It says, And he saith unto them, Ye shall drink indeed of my cup, and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with, but to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared of my Father. That's not mine to give. You got to take that up with the Father. Okay, let's slow down and illustrate this again, all right? <laughs> Brother Elijah, you're going to come up here. Can you imagine if Elijah comes to me and says, hey, Pastor Anderson, you know, I want to lead the singing tonight. You want to lead the singing tonight? No, he doesn't. I'm just kidding. So you want, you know, if he came to me and said, hey, I want to lead the singing tonight. And I said, hey, listen, you're going to have to talk to Pastor Anderson about that. That's not mine to give. I mean, you know, that's not my decision. You need to talk to the pastor. All right. Go ahead and have a seat. Would that make any sense? Okay, what about this? What if I went outside? What if there's a brand new first time visitor and they've never seen the pastor? They don't know who the pastor is, right? <laughs> Just a brand new visitor shows up in the parking lot and I get out, you know, I get off my bike and I'm walking to the parking I'm walking to the building and uh, this guy walks up to me and says, hey, excuse me. You know, I wanted to see if I could, you know, get a Bible. And I said, well, those aren't mine to give. You're going to have to talk to the pastor about that. Okay? Oh, okay, thanks anyway. And then we get to the service, and then all of a sudden he sees me get up and say, all right, everybody, I'm Pastor Anderson, you know, let's turn our Bibles to Genesis 1. What would that guy, what would that guy think about me? He'd think I'm a liar. He would think that I'm a liar and a deceiver because I'd misled him. I lied to him. I deceived him because I said, well, I didn't actually lie. I just said, you know, that, you know, he just has to talk about it. But actually, I did actually lie because I said that's not mine to give when really it was mine to give. I really did have that authority. But Jesus said, that's not mine to give. Get out a pen and just underline those words. Not mine to give. I'm going to underline it right now. In this. I'm going to set the example. It's not mine. Oh, that isn't mine, officer. Oh, that little bag of weed under the seat? That's not mine. You know what that is? That's lying. That's deceiving. If Jesus is God the Father, then he's a liar and a deceiver is what he is. Because he's like, well, that's not mine. That stuff's not mine, officer. I don't even know where that came from. I don't even know who put that there. You know what? That's a lie. But you know what? It's not a lie because Jesus said, that's not mine to give. It's the Father who's going to prepare that for whom he has chosen. That's his decision. That's his prerogative. He's the one who is going to decide who sits at my right hand and on my left. That's not mine to give. Look, was Jesus telling the truth there or was he lying? He was telling the truth. Now, if someone else were out in the parking lot, let's say my son, for example, 
And someone walked up to my son and said, hey, you know, can I lead the singing tonight? And, and he said, well, you know, that's not mine to give. You need to talk to my father. He's the one who has that authority. Would that make sense? Yeah. Right, because we're not the same person. And in fact, we're a father and a son, sort of like Jesus and God the Father are a father and a son. This isn't I'm my own grandpa. You know, oh, he's his own father, he's his own son. Nonsense. Garbage. Craziness. God is a logical, reasonable God. God is not the author of confusion. God is not a deceiver. God is not a liar who pretends to be something that he's not. He is what he is. In fact, that's his name. I am that I am. That's his name. What does that mean? I am that I am. We would say in modern English, I am that which I am. You know, that which I am, that's what I am. I am that I am. Or we might even say, I am who I am. But that's what he's saying. I am that I am. So basically, God doesn't put himself forth as one thing, and he's something totally different. No, he is what he is, what he says he is, who he says he is, and he doesn't lie and play games and deceive. And so, I mean, we don't even have time to look at all the scriptures, but, you know, let's just hit a few highlights. We could just hit a few in John. We go to John chapter 5, for example. John chapter 5. I mean, there are so many reasons why this oneness doctrine makes no sense. I mean, for example, how about the fact that things that are equal, they can't be the exact same thing. You say, well, isn't that what equal means? No, that's not what equal means. That's not what equal means. And all the computer programmers are saying that's right because they deal with that equal sign all the time, don't they? You know what that equal sign means? You know what that equal sign means? It's not the same thing. Okay? See, if I said all men are created equal, it doesn't mean we're all just the same person. Is that what that means? Is that what equality means? Of course not. Equality is when two different people have the same value. That's equality, right? If I said, hey, we're equal, it doesn't mean like, I'm you, you're me. Is that what equality means? No, if I say we're equal, it means, hey, you are as valuable as I am. If I have a value, look, math, folks, A equals B. If A has a value of 5, then B has a value of 5. They're equal. But does that mean that A is B? No, A is A and B is B. <laughs> Otherwise, it would just say A equals A. But even then, even then, A equals A, we'd have two different A's. Because if, if they were really the same exact thing, and the same, then we would just say A. Just A. Because A equals A would be an unnecessary statement. And it, you know. But if we have A equals B, that means we got A over here, and then we have something different over here, B. But they both equal 5. Therefore, they're equal to each other. Does everybody get that? Am I equal with my wife? In some ways, I am. Because my wife is equally human. She is equally valuable in the sight of God. She's equally important in the lives of our children. So in many ways, my wife and I are equal, aren't we? But are we the same person? No. But in some ways, we're unequal, right? Because of the fact that I have authority over my wife. So when it comes to authority, we're not equal. I am greater in authority. That's why Joseph said, no man is greater in this house than I. What did he mean by that? I'm the coolest dude? Is that what he meant? What did he mean when Joseph said, no man is greater in this house than I am? He's saying, look, I'm the boss. I, you, you, Potiphar has given me all authority. He's put all things into my hand. He's trusted me with everything except you because you're his wife. No man is greater in this house than I am. He's talking about authority. Well, that's what Jesus meant when Jesus said, my father is greater than I. My father is greater than I. Why? Because God the Father has authority over the Son. The Son said, I do always those things which please him. He submits himself to the Father. He subjects himself 
to the Father. He obeys the Father and says, not my will, but thine be done. What does the Trinity teach? The Trinity teach that Jesus is God, but that God consists of three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. And when it says these three persons are, or when it says these three are one, it doesn't say these three are one person. It's, it, what it means there is that they're one God. Amen. One God in three persons. Okay. Amen. That's why the Bible calls Jesus God in Hebrews 1.8. Unto the Son he saith, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. You say, well, how can that be? That's three gods. No, it's one God. Well, how is that one God? Because the Bible said it's one God. That's borderline polytheism. Well, first of all, Einstein, poly means many, which is four or more. So, you know, you're way off base there, buddy. Because poly means many gods, number one. And number two, how can you be borderline polytheistic when there's only one God? If there's only one truth, if there's only one reality, if there's only one God, who cares what we're borderline with? Well, the, the Bible is borderline whatever. I don't care what it's on the border of. It's on this side of the border. Amen. Well, I mean, you live in El Cajon, California. That's borderline Mexico. You live in Yuma. That's borderline Mexico. So what? It's America, stupid. Amen. I don't care if you're in Yuma. I don't care if you're in El Cajon. I don't care if you're, look, you may be in El Paso, Texas. Well, it's borderline New Mexico. Yeah, but it's in Texas. <laughs> it's borderline politics. Well, but it's, except that it's in the right side of the border. Right. It's one God still. Right. Right. Three persons, one God can be borderline whatever you want. You're a borderline Jew if you're trying to say that God's not three persons. Because <laughs> you're rejecting the sonship of Christ. You know, whatever, you, you, you're borderline dumb or whatever. I mean, what is, so what? Well, as long as I, but I'm not though, you know? Borderline. You know what? You know what this borderline talk is? A bunch of gray areas. It's black and white, friend. We don't believe in many gods. We believe in one God. So, you know, we can dance right next to the border if you think that's what we're doing. Because we're never going to cross that border because we only believe in one God and we always have and we always will. Who cares where you drew your stupid imaginary border? Your little border patrol is like 75 miles inside the border. You know what I mean? We're 75 miles inside the border of believing in one God, and they're trying to stop us and search us for polytheism. <laughs> and we're like, you know, their, their dog thinks it alerted for polytheism. Well, guess what? It didn't. There's no dead body in the trunk. There are no drugs under the seat. And we believe in one God that is made up of three persons. And you know what? There's only one God. So there's no such thing as a God who's only one person. It doesn't exist because there's only one God and that one God is Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. There's nothing to compare him to. You can't compare God to anyone else. You can't compare him to the gods of the Philistines or the gods of the Hindus. Or the, there's only one. So we'll have one example of what God is. Well, a God, that's one person. No, there's no such thing as a God that's one person except a false God. Because the only God there is is the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. So, he, 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 you know, well, but that's borderline or that's like, he's not like anything. He's just, he is that he is. You know, I mean, that's what it comes down to. Did I have you turn to John chapter 5? Look at John chapter 5, verse 18. Therefore the Jews sought to more, the more to kill him because he had not only broken the Sabbath, but said that God was his father, making himself equal with God, which we just covered. Verse 19, then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. For the Father loveth the Son, and showeth him all things that himself doeth, and he will show him greater works than these, that ye may marvel. Look at verse 22, for the, the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. Well, how can that be if they're the same person? Can somebody explain that to me? Oh, the Father's not judging anybody. It's Jesus who's going to do the judging. Okay, well then, if Jesus does it, according to them, Jesus is God the Father. Sounds like the Father's doing all the judging then. See how this doesn't make any sense? 
because it's a lie, that's why. Verse 30 says, I can of my own self do nothing. What? How does that make sense? Unless he's relying upon the Father who's a different person. Okay, I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father which had sent me. Now, are there two different wills in that verse? I'm not seeking my own will. Oh, just kidding, I really am. Now look, what does three persons mean? Three persons means three identities, check, three wills, three seats of consciousness. Now, how can they not have three seats of consciousness when Jesus Christ was dead for three days and three nights? Who's running the universe? Right? I mean, if Jesus Christ is dead for three days and three nights, I want to know who's running things for three days while he's dead. Or was it just anything, anything goes during that time? Somebody better be running things. God the Father, the Holy Ghost, they're still out there. They're still operating. Okay. Did we read verse 32? Oh, we're in verse 23. Uh, or no, no, let me find my place. 30, 30. I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. What's he saying? If I'm bearing witness of myself, then you know what? Everything I'm saying is a lie. Is that what you believe? Do you believe everything that Christ taught was a lie? Because if you believe in oneness, that's what you're saying. If you reject the Trinity, that's what you're saying. Because Jesus said, if I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. Period. New verse. There's another that beareth witness of me. There's another that beareth witness of me. And I know that the witness which he witnesseth of me is true. Who's that other one that's bearing witness of him that's true? It's God the Father. He explains that in the passage. Verse 43, I'm come in my Father's name, and ye receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him ye will receive. You know, is that, what, is that what's going on? If you don't want to receive the Jesus Christ that came in his Father's name, you know, now you're going after another Jesus who comes in his own name. Right. Because the modalist Jesus, the oneness Jesus, he doesn't come in the name of his Father, he comes in his own name. Yeah. Because they believe that Jesus is the name of God the Father. Right. Well, if God the Father's name is Jesus, then that means Jesus came in his own name. Yeah. If God the Father is Jesus, then Jesus sent himself. He bore witness of himself. He glorified himself. He honored himself. And the Bible said he did none of those things. The Father honored the Son. The Father glorified the Son. The Father sent the Son. The Father is the one who bears record of the Son. How do we know? Because the testimony of two men is true. Go to John chapter 8. Well, I just don't know about that term, you know, persons. Jesus expected expressed image of his person. His person. Not Jesus' person, the Father's person. Are you telling me that Jesus isn't a person? Because we know God the Father is a person distinct from Jesus. So are you telling me the Holy Ghost is not a person? Then why does he get a personal pronoun? He, him, his. Is Jesus a person? And then these oneness heretics, whenever it's convenient, they do this little bait and switch where they go like, oh, well, um, uh, the word, it's, it's, it's God's literal words. But they say it's not a person, though. Well, he walked around and ate food and died and was buried and rose again. That's not a person? Well, he didn't used to be a person. Back in the Old Testament, he wasn't a person. Really? Then how did he walk up to Abraham in the tent? How did he walk in the Garden of Eden in the cool of the day with Adam and Eve if he's not a person? Right? How did he wrestle with Jacob if he's not a person? How did Jacob see the face of God if Jesus isn't a person? Because he is a person, that's why. He was a man. And you know what? Explain to me why some verses in the Old Testament say God's a man and some of them say God's not a man. Can you explain that? I can. I can explain that. You know why? Because Jesus is a man. And God the Father is not a man. God the Father is spirit. Okay, Jesus Christ is the Son of Man. Why? Because he was born of Mary, who's a human being. But that's not when he came into existence. He has always existed. 
and he always will exist as what? A human being, as man. That's why in the Old Testament he's called a man. Even before his incarnation in the New Testament, he is called a man in the Old Testament. He is the firstborn, the Bible says, son of God. The firstborn, why? Because we're all sons of God. The Bible says, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. But Jesus Christ, the firstborn among many brethren, the Bible tells us. How could he be the firstborn? You know what first means? It means you're the first one. It means there's, a, look, I can't say, hey, Isaac is my firstborn. You know why? Because there was somebody before him, Solomon. You see what I'm saying? Solomon is the firstborn. What is the definition of that? It means that no one was born before him, right? Okay, so if Jesus Christ is called the firstborn, the first begotten, then explain this. How could there be a son of God before Jesus? It can't. Then he, if, if there is, he's not the firstborn. He's not the first begotten. He is the firstborn because of the fact that in the beginning, in Genesis 1, he was already the son of God. Because in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, but that Word was not just God's literal words. It was also a person named the Word, who rides on a horse with a name called the Word of God. Okay. John chapter 8. Let me find my place here. I'm, I don't have any notes. I don't really have notes. I'm kind of freestyling this morning. Acts chapter 8, verse 16, or John chapter 8, verse 16, And yet if I judge, my judgment is true, for I am not alone, but I and the Father that sent me. It is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. I am one. Well, you know, I guess that's where the oneness crowd stops reading. <laughs> I'm one. Just stop right there, folks. That's it. That's, they're done. That's where they check out of that verse. I'm one that bear witness of myself and the Father that sent me beareth witness of me. You cannot read that scripture and say that God is one person. You just can't do it. Because he said, well, I'm one. And if you know how to count, if I'm one and then there's another one, that makes two. One plus one is two. <laughs> there's me, I'm one. And then there's the Father that sent me. There's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Okay, Nick and Elijah are in a fight here. They're in a fight, right? Okay, so they're, they're mad at each other. Come on, get in a fight here a little bit here. Okay, whoa, 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 whoa. But guys, guys, hey. Let me mediate. Let me be a mediator. The word mediator means go between. Another word is intercessor, right? Inter, between, cessor, go. Let me intercede. Let me meet, no, no, okay, all right, well, I'll hear both sides, but, okay, so I'm mediating here, okay, let me be a mediator, okay, now, go ahead and have a seat, and, and you know, now Nick and I are in a fight, you know, go ahead, come on, push me, come on, smite me, like the prophet said, right, you know, we're, look, oh, whoa, whoa, hold on, hold on, hold on a second, let me mediate here, okay, Nick, I want you to listen to what pastor has to say here, okay, yeah, you know, that's my son, so go have a seat. You can't go between one item. Right? You, you can't. If you have two people that are at odds, if they're at enmity with each other, you need a go-between. You need an intercessor. We need a daysman betwixt us. Right? That's Jesus. And it's not the same person. Okay? Because of the fact that Jesus is one, and then there's also the Father. That makes two. And then when you throw the Holy Ghost in, you end up with three. And that's where you end up with the Trinity. Anyway, we're out of time. I could go on and on. I mean, I, you know, I've, I've got a list here that I grabbed from my office. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't a sermon outline or anything, but I just, I just grabbed a list of, you know, 50-some verses, 60-some verses uh, that, that talk about the Trinity, that prove the Trinity. And so, it, you know, it's, just, it's people that are just refusing to see the truth or, or, you know, the devil has blinded them or something, or, or they have some weird agenda or ulterior motive. I don't know what it is. I don't care what it is. I'm not going to put up with it. I don't care what it is. You know, you could speculate, what's wrong with these people? What's wrong with them? What's the problem? Wait, you know what? 
To me, it's not as important to know what's wrong with them as just to know that there's something wrong with them and that it's not going to be tolerated here. And you know what? I'm not trying to just see how big our church can get. I don't care how big this church gets. I don't care if it gets smaller. I want it to get big so we can reach more people, but you know what? I'm not into driving fancy cars and living in a fancy house and wearing fancy clothes and being famous and popular and being on TV. I couldn't care less. I care about having integrity. This church is going to have integrity, and I don't care who it is. I don't care if it's my best friends. I don't care if it's people that I love. I don't care if it were my own family members. I don't care if it was my brother or my sister or my mom or my dad. I will not allow one. And, of course, they're all doctrinally sound on the Trinity, of course. But I will not allow this junk into our church, period. Go ahead, test me. Try me now. Test me. You know what I mean? Test me. I don't care who it is. I don't, you say, well, but it's Garrett. I don't care. Amen. You know how long it takes me to make that decision? It, it didn't really even take that long. I was exaggerating when I said it was 30 seconds. <laughs> because, the, I mean, the, 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 the decision's instantaneous. Yeah. It's just, well, then he's gone. Right. Then he's fired. Right. Period. You know what I mean? It's, it's not acceptable. I'm not going to sit here and play favorites for my friends or people that I like or something. No, no, that's not right. See, justice is blind. It's like, that, it's like that picture of the Statue of Liberty with the blindfold and the scales, right? And the sword in one hand. Why? Because justice is supposed to be blind. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what it is. It's just right's right and wrong's wrong. And you know what? Don't get discouraged. But if you do get discouraged, then get discouraged because I'm still not going to stop fighting this garbage. Amen. But, you know, you say, well, you know, I'm discouraged. I'm not discouraged. You know, people, people have been writing me notes and, 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 and saying, hey, brother, I just want to encourage you. I can't imagine what you're going through. Keep fighting. Stand strong. And, you know, what? I really appreciate it. I, I mean, I, I love the encouragement. I love the well wishes. I'm thankful for, for my true friends and people who stand behind me and say things to me like that. But, you know, honestly, I don't even need it because I already felt pretty good. Amen. Thank you very much. And I'm sick of people telling me how to feel. You know what I mean? It's like, look, I'm not going to sit here and cry about it. That's not what God has called me to do, to be the crybaby of our church, the crybaby in chief, the chief crier. I'm not going to get up here and get all sad and cry about it and oh, it's such a shame. Because you know why? The same reason why God rebuked Samuel for crying for Saul. He said, why, why weepest thou for Saul? How long are you going to weep for Saul? Go anoint David, the son of Jesse. Move on. And you know what? How do I feel about these things? You know, obviously it's upsetting. Obviously, it's angering. Obviously, it's disappointing. But you know what? My rock is Jesus. Okay? So nothing's going to move me. I don't care. You know, at the end of the day, I'm going to get up here on Sunday morning, and I'm going to preach the Bible. And my family is going to hear the truth. And all the other hundreds of people that are here this morning are going to hear the truth. And he that hath an ear out in internet land, let him hear. Right? Let him hear the truth. Amen. But you know what? I'm not discouraged. I'm not down. Because you know what? I'm not the one who's going to be punished by God. I'm not the one who's under the curse of God for being thrown out of their local church as a heretic. That's not me. I'm, on, I'm not under the curse of God. You know, I'm going to be blessed. I'm, you know, I'm going to go home. I'm going to eat a nice meal. I'm going to spend time with my family. I'm going to read my Bible. I'm going to go to bed at night meditating on the Word of God. I'm going to wake up in the morning meditating on the Word of God. I'm going to win souls to Christ. And my life's going to go on. And my wife and my children. And you know what? I can know that our church is doctrinally sound. On the fundamentals of the faith, whether we're perfect or not, we are sound on the fundamentals. So I appreciate the encouragement, but I don't need the outpouring of encouragement because I already am encouraged. I already feel pretty good right now. I'm not depressed and crying and sad. And don't tell me that I have to be sad more or cry more or be down more. 
You know what? No. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Amen. The fruit of the Spirit is joy. Amen. You know, I'll tell you, there are times when I get sad and depressed. And you want to know when it is? When I screw up. Right? You know what I mean? If I sin, if I make a mistake, if I screw up, that's when I get sad. That's when I get down and depressed because I just feel like I've let God down. I'm, you know, I messed up. I did something stupid. You know, those are the times that I feel depressed. When somebody stabs me in the back, that doesn't depress me because you know what? The Lord is my rock. Amen. And he's never going to let me down. And this doesn't change anything. Nobody leaving this church will ever change anything. Nobody going off into heresy will ever change anything. This church will continue to be what it is as long as I'm the pastor. And you know what? If I get thrown out from being the pastor, then I'll go start a church across the street and I'll keep doing what I'm doing. And I will never stop doing what I'm doing. The only way that I can fail is if I destroy myself. And I'm not going to do that. And I'm not even in danger of doing that. I'm feeling pretty good right now. I'm right with the Lord right now. Not perfect, but, you know, when I woke up this morning, I loved the Lord. I felt good. When I found this news out, I still loved the Lord. I still went soul winning yesterday and had people saved. I still went soul winning the day before that and had people saved. I still read my Bible and loved it. Nothing's changed. And so, you know what? If you think things have changed, you know, maybe you should just get your focus on the Lord. Because He doesn't change. You know, this is our rock. And, and I mean it. If, you, if you're on the fence about this oneness thing, if you're on the border, you, you get you a little coyote to take you across the border <laughs> and you get out of here because I don't, I don't want you here. Who, who, uh, who agrees with me that we don't want these people in our church? We want them gone. Gone. Get them out. All right, well, there you go. You, you see all those hands? So if you're the one in your heart that's, that's secretly under the covers with a flashlight watching Tyler Baker's sermons, like, ooh, that's a good point. Ooh, that's so good. <laughs> just, just do yourself. Just get out. We don't want you here. Amen. I don't want you here. Other people don't want you here. Amen. We want our church to be Trinitarian. Amen. Trinitarian. All right, let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for your word, Lord, and I just pray that our church would continue to win many souls unto you, Lord, and, and to continue to do great works. I pray that you would just uh, strengthen the faint-hearted, Lord. And God, I pray that you would just purge our church, Lord, of those who are heretics and help us to come out stronger on the other side. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen.